Hi, everybody. Welcome to Pearson the Veil. Hope you guys have all had a good week, and I know we have, and we're real excited tonight to have uh, Paul Blake Smith back, and uh, we're going to continue uh, talking about his books. He's, he's a, an author, and he has books on all kinds of stuff, especially Cape Girardeau incident. And now we're going to be talking about Gleason and Nixon and a UFO incident. Well, I don't even know if it's an incident, but their connection. So I'll bring uh, Paul up and we'll uh, we'll get talking. Hi, welcome back. Good evening, sir. How are you doing? Good. Thank you yeah, for I'm having me I'm excited to listen to about uh, Gleason and Nixon. Yeah, it's a terrific story. I was on uh, like a week or two ago with a woman who was from Miami. Uh, she's not living there now, but she says, I remember these rumors going around in the months and years after this affair, like Nixon and Gleason were up to something. So it wasn't maybe a complete secret that some people were talking and uh, that uh, what these two were doing uh, running around from like nine to midnight one night in 1973 is a terrific story. I was astonished to find that there was no previous book on this. Nobody had researched this and done a book. So kind of like the Cape Girardeau story, I, I wrote that after I couldn't find anyone to write a book. And that was in my own hometown. So a 1941 UFO crash there made an excellent uh, book subject. And then uh, Dwight Eisenhower and what he did as president. And so the sequel to that is the Nixon Gleason alien encounter and features a U.S. president uh, at an Air Force base in the middle of the night, uh, just like Dwight Eisenhower. And uh, what they saw, and what they did, I tried to nail it down as precisely as I could. And it's a terrific story. If you've got a few minutes, you can listen to this broadcast or find the book on Amazon. There you go. I'll bring, uh, I think I had the picture of your, uh, let me see. There it is. Uh, that's the published book version, print version. There's also an excellent uh, audio version from Tantor.com. Uh, and uh, I'm honored that they chose uh, the Eisenhower book and this Nixon book because they're selling pretty well and uh, they're getting really good reviews. And I cram as much information and sources in there as I possibly can to make sure the reader gets his money's worth. So uh, to set the stage, we have to go back to uh, uh, 1972, really, when Nixon won a re-election by a landslide, it was like historic proportions. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, former President Truman died. And uh, a month later, former President Johnson died. Nixon was re-inaugurated and he was the only living American president. They were all gone. So he's free to do whatever he wants, safely re-elected. And it gave him a kind of power and a sense of, uh, I'm king of the hill. I'll do whatever I please. Uh, the press kind of dubbed him the imperial presidency. King Richard is what they call him because he did basically whatever he wanted. So I think that's the attitude he had going into mid-February of 73 uh, when he decided to go to Miami and visit Jackie Gleason, who was hosting a celebrity pro-am golf tournament just outside his house at the Inverary Country Club in Louder Hill, Florida. That's a suburb of Miami. And sure enough, Nixon showed up. He landed in a helicopter on a Monday afternoon. It's in his presidential records uh, and got out. And Jackie went over in a golf cart to pick him up at this helipad on the golf course. I talked to one of Nixon's few surviving aides his assistant, and he said, oh, I was sure I was about to see Jackie Gleason get his head lopped off on national television that day. He was all excited about Nixon, and he ran, ran right to the helicopter, and he could have uh, had those blades decapitate him live on yeah. national television. Uh, it, Jackie's not a tall man, so that may have saved him. Uh, maybe if he bent over a little bit, he was kind of short. So he helped Nixon into this golf cart, and they buzzed away followed by the Secret Service and another golf cart, over to these microphones, and Nixon got out and talked to the press. It was on a national television, CBS, and they stopped the golf tournament that Monday afternoon, and Nixon spoke uh, 
about the war he was ending in Vietnam and bringing the troops home and uh, how he wanted to contribute some money to Jackie's golf tournament charity for Boys and Girl Scouts of America, I believe it was. And then uh, after a little give and take, Jackie uh, got the driver's seat of his golf cart and took Nixon back to the helipad uh, not far from Jackie's house. Jackie lived on the 18th uh, green, the 18th hole, really. And uh, Nixon got back in his helicopter and his pilot took Marine One chopper back to uh, uh, Key Biscayne, where Nixon was staying. So we know right away Nixon knew about the chopper pad. His pilot had the coordinates and had successfully pulled off this landing right near Jackie's house during broad daylight, knew how to do this and take off. So this is the clue we can look for how these two got together later that night after 8.30, maybe about 9 o'clock. I doubt if Nixon went back himself, but I'm sure he sent his chopper pilot back to that helipad. Nixon got on the phone and called Jackie and said, there's something I want you to see. Go out to the chopper pad. My man will take you right out to uh, the site where I want you to uh, view something. And he didn't tell him what he didn't. Jackie was um, unaware, according to his story, that he told later he had no idea where he was going other than Nixon wanted him to see something. So he got in the helicopter and it was about a 20 minute flight to Homestead Air Force Base south of Miami. Uh, there's this uh, silly story that Nixon showed up in a car and the two drove, which would have been about 45 miles uh, from Nixon's uh, beach house to Gleason's house in the dark. And, uh, and then about 45 or 50 miles down to Homestead Air Force Base in the dark. That didn't happen. It didn't have to happen. Both Nixon and Gleason had a chopper pad right behind their homes. Yeah. Uh, Nixon was president of the United States and he could have anything he wanted. And so he had a right. chopper pad put in right behind his beach house in uh, Key Biscayne. So he took that back and forth to Homestead Air Force Base about 55 times. That's how many times he visited Homestead and Key Biscayne during his presidency. That's a yeah. whopping amount, isn't it? Right, it <laughs> he is. He had a home in San Clemente, <laughs> California. And it was customary for presidents to... Uh, stay with a wealthy benefactor and make them feel important and worth donating money to his campaign. Instead, he had to have this beach house and kind of had it custom built uh, by the, the shore in Key Biscayne to go back and forth to Homestead so many times. And so I found a number of rumors that said there was some otherworldly things at Homestead Air Force Base. And uh, if you're the United States president, you're in charge of the the military and intelligence and uh, important matters. And so you would need to know what's going on there, even if it was from another world. And I think that's what happened. And uh, we have to stop here to talk about Jackie's uh, obsession that Nixon wanted to take advantage of. We were talking about this on the pregame show, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh... I, I actually have the picture of the house on her, on your uh, thumbnail. To and I don't know. I, I assume that's actually the real house. Uh, the circular UFO house Jackie had custom built in New York, uh, just out of, outside of New York City, and he sold it in 1964 and moved lock, stock, and barrel to Miami, mostly so he could play golf all day. He was obsessed with golf. He kind of went overboard on things. And so he told CBS, you want me and my show? You're going to have to produce it from Miami. And they caved in. And since Jackie was like the number one TV star who made the most money, had the biggest, he insisted, the biggest, longest limousine. <laughs> he didn't drive himself. Uh, he was a terrible driver, according to everyone who knew him. So he moved his show to Miami as of 1964. And he sold this special custom-built spaceship house that he built on the side of a bluff uh, outside of New York City. And I bet that thing cost over a million bucks. It was very expensive and lavish in its design. It was surrounded by a couple of circular little uh, scout ships, he would call them. The garage was circular, like a UFO or an alien craft to hold his car, even though he didn't really drive again. But uh, 
He wanted the finest of everything. Jackie made up to $14 million per year, so he could throw his money away on almost anything. And that's where we get to a key part of this uh, Nixon Gleason story. Uh, people will ask me, oh, come on, why would Nixon show him some otherworldly things when that's super top secret, a matter of national security? Uh, Jackie was not even in the military intelligence, had no security clearance, and it was very risky. But again, Nixon felt like I'm king of the world. I can do anything I want. But Jackie had something that Nixon wanted. By uh, early 73, Nixon had gotten himself caught in the Watergate scandal. The burglars on his team broke into Democratic Party headquarters and tried to bug this phone and take some photos and such, and they got caught. Nixon wanted to cover that up and not let anyone know about this. And he wanted the burglars to remain silent. So Nixon needed hush money to shut them up and pay their lawyers and keep their families afloat in this tough time where their, uh, uh, their dads were all in jail there. So um, Nixon needed over a million dollars. And uh, on the White House tapes, he was <laughs> bugging himself in the White House in the Oval Office. He can be heard as of January, late January of 73, saying, where are we going to get this hush money? This darn hush money. He was really upset about uh, raising privately over a million dollars to pay off the Watergate burglars and their lawyers. So here's where Jackie came in. Jackie had been offering a million dollars to anyone who would show him the proof of extraterrestrials. It had to be hard, solid proof. His whole life, he'd been wanting to see this, but over the last few years, he doubled the amount from half a million. He went on like a radio show in New York City and, and would make this offer very seriously. I'll give a half a million dollars to anyone who could show me the hard proof that we're being visited. And so he doubled that. And by 73, I think Nixon went for it. He needed the money desperately. Jackie was his supporter, his friend, knew to keep his mouth shut. Had a million dollars. Jackie made up to 14 million per. He could easily write a check for Nixon. So Jackie got what he wanted. And Nixon got what he wanted. Uh, they even shared the same lawyer who went to prison for paying off Watergate burglars these bundles of cash. Gee, where did he get that money now in hindsight? To this day, they don't know where officially, uh, according to the story, where uh, a man named Herbert Kalmbach got this cash to distribute to various Watergate figures to keep quiet. That's obstruction of justice. You go to prison for it. So uh, it's never come out where that money came from. But I think we can put two and two together and within reason and say Jackie made a political donation under the table, wrote him a check or, uh, uh, you know, fixed it up through a, an attorney of his to transfer cash. And so Nixon invited Jackie along to Homestead Air Force Base. So uh, Jackie gets on the helicopter and they fly out there. And it's uh, in Nixon's records where he was that day up until 8.30 at night. And then it says in his digitized presidential records, you can go online, there is a document removed from this file that would have told you where he's at after 8.30. Uh, in the official documents, Nixon's schedule shows up. Uh, he shows up for breakfast the next morning, uh, gets dressed and flies back to Homestead Air Force Base and takes off in Air Force One. So um, we can also surmise that it was necessary to remove this revealing document about a chopper ride over to Homestead Air Force Base and maybe be back by midnight. Uh, and that's when Jackie came home later that night uh, to Louder Hill to his country club estate and uh, was ashen and pale and shaken. He was really emotional. And he walked into the door and slumped into an armchair. He was kind of dazed. And his wife said, what happened? Where have you been? So he blurted out the truth. Nixon just showed me the proof of uh, alien visitation. It was over at Homestead Air Force Base. And he took me over there and he showed me the hard proof. And he said, I saw the bodies of dead aliens. And his wife was skeptical at first. And he explained. And she noticed how deeply emotional he was. All shook up like uh, he got what he wanted after a lifelong obsession. He finally got the hard proof and it just blew him away. Makes you wonder if he saw more than what he related to his wife. 
which were officially dead bodies of aliens. And I'll tell you the description. Don't want to tell too much so you won't buy the book, but uh, uh, <laughs> everybody watching this show is going, all right, what do they look like? Well, let me get a little drink of water here. Jackie said Nixon greeted him at Homestead. They were greeted by also an armed escort with guns. These military officers, they surrounded him, gave him a drive across the base to an isolated building. And there was an armed guard at the doorway to this kind of laboratory. Uh, for lack of a better term, it might have even been a kind of morgue for bodies. And the guard stepped aside and Jackie and Nixon went in alone left their armed escort out in the parking lot and flicked on the lights. And there were four examining tables with four small dead aliens. Uh, they apparently were not a joke. They were not stuffed animals or a, a hoax rigged up by Nixon. Jackie got a good look at them, said they had big pointy ears, big bug eyes, and they were only like two or two and a half feet tall. They were dwarfish in size. Wow and that uh, he was thoroughly creeped out. Apparently Nixon didn't give him too much information on uh, where they came from. Jackie had to um, speculate to his wife, there must have been a crash around here somewhere. Uh, so he did not know exactly where these beings came from. Now in doing my research for this book, um, I noticed the story of the 1955 Hopkinsville, Kentucky, uh, alien invasion of this uh, Sutton family. You may be familiar with that story yeah. where these tiny little dwarfish aliens with big pointy ears, big bug eyes, uh, two feet, two and a half at most, ran around this farm family out in the Kentucky uh, uh, countryside and terrorized them for a few hours. And they matched the same description, uh, exactly what Jackie told his wife he saw at Homestead. So I'm thinking possibly this is the same race. Uh, they didn't seem to have any visible injuries, but they were quite dead. Jackie said they looked like maybe they'd been embalmed. And so that gives you another clue that possibly this was a kind of morgue, maybe for incoming uh, dead American troops. But, you know, you improvise when you've got alien visitors and you've got their bodies. What else do you do with them? You might embalm them or study them scientifically. Uh, vivisection, cut them up and weigh their organs and such. Uh, Jackie didn't report any stitches, but uh, I kind of wonder how much he left out in what he told his wife. Right. Uh, it's important to know that Jackie was a trusted FBI informant who uh, felt friendly towards J. Edgar Hoover. And he, he had died, uh, Hoover had died just the year before. Another factor in Nixon feeling like he could do whatever he wanted including showing aliens to a civilian like Jackie, and um, that Nixon had friends in high places. He knew a lot of Republican politicians and was friends with Gerald Ford and even invited Ford uh, two years later to his golf tournament. And Ford came down and played uh, on the same course right outside Jackie's home. So uh, Jackie uh, was trusted with these secrets. He was a Freemason, apparently high ranking, and he had more connections there. So uh, before they left this laboratory, uh, Jackie told his wife that night, Nixon swore me to secrecy, made me take an oath. So uh, he did and probably took that seriously at the time. But as soon as he got home, he broke that oath and told his wife everything, or at least most things. Uh, in a legal case, uh, lawyers will present something that you've blurted out at the time of great trauma. Uh, like at a murder scene, you blurt out, uh, like, I think Joe over here did this. He had a gun. Oh, my God, he's dead. And you blurt out something that could be factual. It's called an excited utterance. And I think that's kind of like what Jackie did when he got home. He blurted out the truth. And then later he clammed up. Uh, Jackie's wife believed the story and gave an interview a year later to a tabloid and mentioned this somewhat in passing. And uh, the tabloid printed the story. Uh, Jackie and Beverly were uh, split apart at the time, but not divorced. Beverly was hoping uh, one year after this incident to get back with Jackie 
Uh, but when Jackie read this article, he blew up and phoned her up and yelled at her, you're never to tell this story. This is not something for the public to hear. You know, and he didn't deny the story. People, uh, showbiz types and reporters started calling him and say, what about the story your wife told in a 1974 National Enquirer or something like that? And he refused to answer. He didn't say, oh, this is a lot of nonsense. Get out of here with this foolishness. I never said any such thing. He just said, I have no comment. I'm not going to talk about it which leads you once again to believe that the story is true and Jackie was no liar. He didn't make up things. Uh, that's something I read in biographies and it's important to note, Jackie may have been a comedian who performed and acted on his TV show and in movies, but he was not a fibber, fabricator. He didn't just make up a bunch of stupid stuff. Uh, he was always after the truth. And this is what led him to buy over 1,700 books and periodicals on the paranormal, heavy on UFOs. He wanted the facts. And he would then call up uh, book authors and quiz them intensely on every detail in the book and sometimes call up uh, the subjects within the book and quiz them intensely. He wanted to know every last detail. He was so obsessed with facts about the paranormal, ESP, uh, extraterrestrial visitation, reincarnation. Uh, Jackie's wife said that he felt that he lived before in past lives. And that's another important story that uh, shows you Jackie had this kind of secret private life during his career that uh, he really couldn't go public with. But uh, in 74, when his wife, uh, his estranged wife, gave this uh, interview and it went public, that was the end of their marriage. They broke up and Jackie uh, remarried or got married a third time to another woman. And uh, by 1983, uh, Beverly Gleason decided to write a book about her time with the great Gleason, they call him uh, the great one. And she started uh, to write this one page article for the Inquirer because they paid money for her stories. She needed a little money. She had a great story, and she talked about more at length what Jackie told her one night when he slumped into that chair uh, close to midnight in February of 1973. So that um, she wrote this article, and it, it came out, got published, and you can expect this part of the story. Jackie phoned her up furious and chewed her out again, even though he was uh, decidedly uh, uh, an ex-spouse. He called up Beverly and, you know, probably threatened to cut off her uh, uh, divorce settlement or payments or something that uh, you keep your mouth shut. You're not to talk about this. I told you before, but it was too late. The article came out and Jackie was inundated with more reporters calls asking, what about this story? And again, he refused to deny it. He says, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, in a recent article that came out after my book was released last year, uh, a number of show business friends asked Jackie, how do you know we're being visited by aliens? And he told them, Nixon showed me the proof. That's all I want to say. Nixon showed me the proof. He would tell that in private to his showbiz friends, but he wouldn't talk to the press and he wouldn't go public with this amazing story. But we can be assured again, Nixon and Gleason were close. They'd spent the 60s occasionally golfing together. They were both conservative men who perspired a lot and drank too much. And uh, uh, they both had teenage daughters to raise. Uh, Jackie was divorced, of course, and his uh, daughters went to live with his first wife. But there was lots of things in common between the two men. You might think at first Nixon and Gleason, but right. they actually had plenty in common. So they had a pretty good friendship. Now, I, I, I might have missed it, but was there a crash anywhere during that time that would have correlated with what uh, Nixon showed Gleason? Is there anything I, in the country around yeah. that time? I don't know from early 73 or late 72 if there was one specifically. But so many of these things get hushed up at the time. Uh, the press just didn't cover UFOs, you know, like they might do now. Uh, it was still kind of taboo or... Uh, the Inquirer would cover the story, but they were felt to be somehow a shaky tabloid type approach. But they put together a blue ribbon panel 
uh, to examine UFOs, including Dr. J. Allen Hynek, a very respected and esteemed uh, uh, UFO investigator for the government. So uh, if there was a crash around the time that could have resulted in these bodies, I'm not quite aware of that. Uh, but frankly, they could have come from any sort of crash anywhere at any time and right. uh, been preserved. And uh, Nixon arranged for them to be laid out on these examining tables. And Jack told Jackie, help yourself. Go take a close look. Uh, probably told him, this is what your million dollars have got you. Uh, you can't take any notes or photos, but you can look them over and then we're going to swear you to secrecy and don't talk about this. So uh, Jackie went home that night and he was also so shook up, he began to drink more than usual, had trouble sleeping and eating, and uh, he had trouble working. He didn't work much for the rest of that year. He didn't make another movie until... Um, uh, the one before Smokey and a Bandit came out. He made this obscure movie in like 76, 77. So it was about three or four years before he could work again. He did make a TV special late in the 73 on the Honeymooners. Uh, that's to his credit. But uh, it really shook him up emotionally. Probably made him dive more into the subject, get more books, do more research. Uh, he had seen the hard proof. And his wife said, uh, Beverly at the time, he would thunder angrily around the house at the government for uh, hiding the truth. He said, they know the truth. They've got the bodies and they keep lying and they keep making people who come forward with their own UFO stories or sightings of aliens uh, look like idiots, that they're crazy. When in fact, the government's got the proof. They know we are being visited. They're hiding the truth from us. So Jackie would get alternately angry and then he would get all giddy with excitement that nixon showed me the proof above all american citizens i got to see it above all other people this is a big top secret and i was let in on it and he would be giddy with excitement that he and then his mood would swing back again so he really had a tough time and he was someone who was braced up from reading about extraterrestrials and talking to people about it privately so he kind of knew what to expect, and that's how emotional he was in the aftermath of seeing this. And it makes you wonder if the government ever went full bore, here's the whole truth, here's some video footage we took in 1941, 47, uh, 63, or whenever, and here's some of the bodies in photographs and film footage. If they ever told us the truth, Boy, I hope we would react better than Jackie, who got very, very emotional and drank too much and ate too much. And, uh, you know, right. it, it affected him deeply. So uh, the government may use Jackie as an example to this day privately and say, look what happens when we show you the truth. You, uh, you, you get uh, full of uh, emotional turmoil. You know, it's, you know, every time I think about Jackie, you know, and UFOs, I always go back to the honeymooners when he dressed up as an alien or a spaceman yeah. during that uh, show. And, and yeah. obviously they showed it on uh, Back to the Future in the movie, the little scene of him. <laughs> Alice, I am the man from space. <laughs> you romp, you look more like a fat fool from Brooklyn or something like that. He put <laughs> yeah. together his own alien costume because he was so obsessed. He wanted that on the honeymooners. It was in late 55 that that show ran some months after the Hopkinsville, Kentucky crash, by the way. But Jackie wanted to show his interest in uh, not only Freemasonry with the Raccoon Lodge, the Grand Mystic Exalted Poobah, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the raccoon hat, the yep. salute, handshake. That was all the parody of the Freemasons that Jackie was a part of, but also Jackie's uh, obsession with aliens. Uh, since my book came out, there was also some footage of an old, Jackie Gleason show where this giant alien creature comes in and uh, stands behind him and he doesn't realize it at first. And he goes about the house doing some chores, like, ah! you know, and his eyes would pop out. And so there's another example of Jackie was open to uh, alien visitation even before he was allowed to see the actual hard proof, the evidence that uh, we are not alone. His book collection, we talked about that a little bit. Was that in the UFO house, that whole book collection? Because it was like a th over a 1,000 books or something, isn't right. it? Right. He had an apartment in New York City in the 50s where he started doing his Honeymooner show and then the Jackie Gleason variety show. 
And he had this house custom built over several years. And one of his first guests in it was Richard Nixon, vice president of the United States. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, that was uh, indica indicative that they were two friends even in the late 50s and uh, a real a political supporter of the vice president. So uh, some of the books could well have been there. Uh, I've got a book from Audrey Meadows who played uh, Alice Cramden. And right. she said, Jackie invited me to a party and I went there and everything is round. Like the seats were round. There was big round bay windows where you could look out. And uh, like everyone said, it was like uh, living in a flying saucer where you'd look out below on this valley and uh, Jackie must have wanted it to look and feel as much like a spaceship as possible. And uh, this even made like uh, Popular Mechanics magazine when it was finished around 59 or 60. And that uh, there was a little talk about this at the time. And it was Jackie's private UFO house. And he eventually sold it to CBS executives who rented it out to various people over the years, including David Bowie, the rock star, who lived there. There were telescopes. Uh, Jackie had it outfitted with a Tesla coil. And uh, David Bowie went on to play Nikolai Tesla in a uh, in a movie. So uh -huh. there's some real connection, a very strange combination there, David Bowie and Jackie Gleason. But uh, they were both obsessed with UFOs. I got a whole chapter on uh, John Lennon, David Bowie, and Gleason in uh, my book. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy that, the overall story and how it kind of relates to when Nixon was vice president to Dwight Eisenhower. And he too went to an Air Force base late at night. There's like top 10 list of similarities between uh, the method of operations by Dwight Eisenhower and what Nixon did with Gleason that night, sneaking out in the middle of the night, going to an Air Force base on the exact same date, February 19th, 54 for Eisenhower, uh, 73 for Nixon. Uh, wow. So I checked Nixon's records. Did he go back on the 20th anniversary of the Eisenhower encounter? And he did. He went to Homestead Air Force Base in South Florida. Uh, and there's a lot of records missing from the 74 file. Very suspicious. Some things have been removed and other things were not recorded, as I put in my book, about uh, one year after the Nixon-Gleason encounter. Could Nixon have invited Gleason again? I don't know. It's possible for February of 74. It's a very mysterious uh, event there. So uh, these things keep happening. Uh, and if we want to backtrack even a little more, Lyndon Johnson talked to uh, Dwight Eisenhower on the exact uh, 10th anniversary of the Eisenhower encounter, February 19th, 1970, or er, uh, 64. Then... Johnson got on a plane and flew all the way out to Palm Springs to huddle with Eisenhower in private. And they went uh, uh, to a couple of locations and uh, the uh, presidential records that you can review online have some gaps. So what Eisenhower and LBJ were doing on the 10th anniversary, I don't know what uh, Nixon was doing on the 20th anniversary. I don't know, but uh, he was around uh, the same Air Force bases when he showed Jackie in 73, the hard proof. Uh, was there a kind of lab for processing alien beings there? Could be, uh, or Nixon just ordered, uh, like from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base or some other uh, facility, these bodies to be flown in and displayed for Jackie to view them under an armed guard and then uh, uh, to put the bodies back where they, where they came from. I don't honestly know uh, what was the arrangement there, but uh, it's intriguing that Nixon didn't seem to have much of a reaction. He was like totally calm about it, according to Jackie. It was Jackie who got all emotional. So that gives you an indication Nixon knew all about this sort of thing. Right. It didn't bother him at all. Now, which uh, I might be getting it mixed up, but which president was supposed to be going to a, a dentist or something or trying to yeah. make an appointment? I looked into that story and found out it was true. Eisenhower went to a dentist the night after February 19th, 1954, when he went out to uh, Edwards Air Force Base to meet some out-of-this-world visitors. The next night, he was chewing on a duck leg at a dinner in Palm Springs. 
when he bit into some buckshot and broke off uh, a cap on one of his teeth. And they told him, oh, Mr. President, I'm so sorry. The boy shot that duck this morning and used buckshot. He was very upset, said, what kind of a sportsman uses buckshot? And look what it's done to my tooth. So they called a dentist and the dentist received this call in the evening and said, oh, yeah, the president wants to uh, have me work on his tooth. Sure. And he hung up, went to sleep. And they waited and waited. Eisenhower went to the dentist's office and they finally called the dentist again. Where are you? The president's waiting. He's really? So he went hustling over there and Eisenhower was treated for uh, a, a new crown, a temporary new crown. That story was somehow uh, conflated with the Eisenhower encounter at Edwards Air Force Base, but they're actually two separate incidences. Uh, and uh, it, it's not, it doesn't bother me when that happens. But I've talked to a woman who said, I talked to a good friend who was at that dinner with Eisenhower, and that's the truth, that he bit into uh, some buckshot and busted his tooth, and that was a real dental emergency. But uh, the night before, Eisenhower snuck out while the press was distracted at a party in Palm Springs at a hotel, and he had free reign to fly over to Edwards Air Force Base, and these uh, friendly aliens came landed in five ships and were checked out by Air Force officials who called Eisenhower and said, come on in. They appear to be friendly. And he went there and spoke to them on February 19th, 1954. I think it was a Saturday night. No, Friday night. Uh, and uh, they were uh, uh, not only friendly and, and warm and kind, but they spoke English and they were quite familiar with our ways. And so when Nixon was notified of all of this, he was back in Washington at that time as vice president. Uh, I don't know, but I think by the time uh, the second term of Eisenhower and Nixon began in 55, it was obvious Nixon was going to be the standard bearer of the party and he was going to be trusted with more shocking secrets. So I'm sure as the uh, late 50s rolled along, he was being briefed that we are being visited and some of them are friendly and uh, talkative, and they're concerned about our atomic weapons testing program and the pollution we're spewing into the atmosphere. We're killing the planet. And uh, I think that's a pretty legitimate reason for aliens to uh, land and speak to a president, don't you? That they're right. observing uh, the, uh, the pollution. Back in the 50s, we were just spewing filth from smokestacks, factories, from car exhaust. Uh, just all manner of smoky fires. We'd set fire to like a, a field or a forest to clear the land. And, and it was just buildings. You see pictures of buildings in the 40s and 50s. And there's black soot over so much stuff. Had to be sandblasted or air blasted in years later when uh, we began to wise up and clean up the atmosphere and uh, clean up our major cities. So uh, aliens were deeply concerned. And I think uh, Nixon may have been needed at Homestead Air Force Base to uh, attend to an agreement that Eisenhower forged uh, back in 54 and might have needed renewing. And that's why he decided to invite Jackie and to say, why don't you show up here? I'll send a helicopter for you since oh. maybe uh, Nixon needed to be there in the first place. So uh, wow. we can speculate, but it's it kind of all fits together. During uh, Watergate and uh, Nixon obviously recording all the calls and all the private conversations in the White House, was there anything else UFO related or was that all blacked out? And de uh, Yeah. Uh, so we Douglas, see it. I'm a friend of Douglas Caddy, who was a Watergate burglar attorney for E. Howard Hunt. And during the course of Hunt's uh, arraignment and trial, uh, Mr. Caddy, who's still alive, uh, said, I asked E. Howard Hunt, who worked for Nixon, uh, you know, what's the big secret everyone's keeping in regards to the government and, and uh, uh, what Watergate was all about when you boil it down? What were you after? And Howard Hunt supposedly told him uh, the visitation that we are not alone and that uh, that's not a secret to be let out to the public. And it had maybe something to do with the Watergate burglars heard about the Democrats had a file on this or something. It's not something that's come out really too much. But according to Mr. Caddy, E. Howard Hunt uh, confessed this, that, that that was a hidden side of Watergate uh, to keep the lid on the alien visitation secret. It was still not 
considered fit for public consumption at the time, 1972, 73, 74. And it cost Nixon everything, the presidency, his place in history, his sense of dignity. He's kind of a, the butt of jokes to this day. He had to resign from office due to the Watergate scandal that he helped to cover up. And so uh, it just all unraveled and he came a little emotionally unraveled, but uh, he got it together in his retirement, wrote several books. According to one biographer, uh, this man, a writer, went in to talk to Nixon and, and happened to mention, uh, what do you know about aliens or are we being visited? And Nixon had an opinion on everything and would talk at length. But on that question, Nixon just ah. raised his eyebrows and said nothing. He refused to answer. So the uh, the biographer said, I moved on to other subjects. So that kind of tells you something there, too. That, that brings up a good point, though. You mentioned it earlier about how Jackie reacted, you know, when he came home, that he was emotional and distraught and all this stuff, you know. I mean, we had the War of the Worlds radio incident where people supposedly killed themselves jumping out of buildings. And we, we got this, what you're talking about, Jackie. I mean, we watch sci-fi movies and all this stuff, but are we really mentally capable of uh, taking in that information that, okay, this is actually an alien from extraterrestrial? Yeah, maybe not back then in 39 when that, uh, or 38 or 39 when that, or 37, I think it was, when that broadcast over the airways caused people to panic or even have a heart attack uh, thinking we're being invaded. But Jackie saw dead aliens just laying there under armed guards. So uh, he still got upset. And so, uh, yeah, were they ready? In the early 70s, we still had a few movies about aliens. My Favorite Martian with Ray Walston was on TV. But since then, everything's exploded. We've got all kinds of sci-fi movies, TVs, books, uh, comic books. Uh, we've had Mork and Mindy, Close Encounters, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. We're much more broken in mentally, psychologically prepared nowadays than in Nixon's time and Jackie's time. So that uh, I don't think it would be quite a shock. And a, a few years ago, 60 Minutes did a story on this and the government seemed to kind of admit, yeah, we're being visited. We don't know what these things are which was soft peddling it, in my opinion. And it didn't make much news. No one seemed to just go berserk. It didn't make that many headlines. This was around like 2020 or 2021. Right. Uh, it was very telling in this 60 Minutes interview. They interviewed uh, military uh, officials and pilots. And one of the pilots said, we see these things flying around every single time we go out in our uh, uh, airplanes uh, on missions, you know, going up and down the coast, tests, flights and such, every single time, the unexplained things zipping by and stopping on a dime and taking off and uh, orbs and uh, just stuff that can't be explained by human technology. So uh, <laughs> it gets harder and harder to have the government say, well, there's nothing happening. We don't know of anything. It's a mystery to us. Uh, I have heard of um, a CIA agent named John Ramirez, who says, it's my information, the government is planning to keep a lid on this until the year 2027. That's when something's scheduled to happen. Maybe he doesn't know what, or he's not saying what, but it's very tantalizing, like what's going to happen? So the government is continuing to kind of tamp down on this and pretend like we don't know what's going on, deny this in a roundabout way. And uh, for the next three years, we're just going to have to put up with it if this story is true. Uh, maybe there's a landing planned or a presentation of some kind coming that we need to be more broken into to accept psychologically in the meantime. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the next three years. Stick around. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, hopefully I, I, no heart attacks. I think I'd be more mentally stable to accept, okay, like a conference of aliens and our government officials than, say, one landing in my backyard and I experience it one night up front. Because I think that's the shocker that people see is like when you when you first hand out a surprise, okay, there's an alien, there's, there, there's an extraterrestrial. I think that's the thing where people freak out more. Yeah, and this kind of opens up a can of worms. I'm sure we've got friendly aliens. Some of them are human-like. 
like what Eisenhower meant. And others are cold, like these little grays that probe you, kidnap you, abduct you, look you over and put you back. And others, a couple others could have a pretty dark agenda. And so people might conflate them all together. They're all aliens and they're all evil or they're all friendly. And that might not be accurate either. So the government has a tough job here bracing us up for possibly a variety of personalities and, and aliens that have different agendas and what's going to happen uh, as we go forward and maybe slowly drip by drip disseminate this to the public. I'd love to see somebody hack a file or uh, someone in the government get a wild hair in them and decide to deliberately leak a file. And, right. you know, that's what is alleged to have been about this um, this alien video from 2011. They called him Skinny Bob. You know, this alien that looks around with the big bulbous eyes. His right. forehead seems to bulge a little. His eyelids move. He reaches over and grabs something. That's a fascinating video. If there's any real footage of an alien, supposedly the Russians contacted or were contacted by this gray creature in 1942. And the, the video footage was hacked by somebody who got it, I think from the United Nations or some business like this. And you can see it on the internet. Some people think it's fake. And I've read from others who say, I work with CGI. This is definitely not CGI. This thing is real. And it has an authentic KGB logo of the era at the start of the film. That may have been a, an example that somebody hacked a file and leaked it to the public and it wasn't supposed to come out. And uh, you can watch it and judge it for yourself. Huh. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing the stuff that's out there. And like you said, you know, the CGI and now AI. I mean, yeah. it's Scary. hard to tell a lot of times. You know, people can say, you know, I know this is real, but it's like, how do we really know it's real? I've been impressed with some things AI and other things are laughable. Uh, someone had a picture of Jennifer Aniston that they rigged up who has her arms up like this. And there's a third arm coming out of her side that yeah. AI loused this up and gave her three arms. It was hilarious. And there's pictures that- Unless Jennifer's me. really an alien. Yeah, we don't <laughs> yeah. well, then uh, where's that corresponding fourth arm? But uh, uh, there's pictures of President Trump uh, like praying his hands. And you notice carefully, he's got six fingers per hand. AI loused up the photo. So this is an example of how AI has to be very carefully programmed or it becomes laughable, a laughing stock. But I've also heard music on the Internet. They've uh, used AI to create uh, a different sound to, let's say, some of the Beatles music. And some right. of it's just awkward. And others, wow, this sounds great. It's like a hidden song. And even the Beatles themselves used AI technology to bring out John Lennon's authentic voice and create a new song. And, you know, that opens a can of worms of what artists would like to do with their past work or give permission to people to do with their future work. And uh, I think the governor of Tennessee recently uh, passed uh, the Elvis law, which is about confining AI to uh, uh, not uh, hack into artists' uh, music without the permission of the estate to create all new sound and uh, music and images of uh, famous celebrities. So kind of, we're kind of getting the, are coming, coming to grips with what could be done here. You might be able to take existing footage of someone and make them do the most outrageous stuff and make it look real. Uh, did you catch a 60 Minutes report that showed an example? They, uh, somebody made a video footage of Tom Cruz, the actor, singing and playing the guitar. And wow, you would never know. The whole thing was faked. They used Tom Cruise's image. They used a guy who kind of looked like him, morphed him together, uh, used his voice. Uh, Tom ha Cruise, I don't think, even plays the guitar. But that's just a small example. You could have uh, a video of the president beating up a horse or uh, uh, tackling his wife or you know doing right. anything crazy. And the truth uh, is still getting its pants put on while the, the lie goes circling around the world, as they say. I think uh, Mark Twain had a, uh, a comment close to that. I'm paraphrasing. And that's another example. Is like, oh, my gosh, look at this video. And everyone will think it real at first and get that ingrained in their brain and then find out later, oh, the whole thing's fake. But the, the truth that it is a fake 
has to get out there quickly. Uh, and so someone could do the same with extraterrestrials, uh, put together a video like, I saw this landing, got out my camcorder or my cell phone and fake the whole thing and say, this came down in the woods over here. And uh, boy, what a mess. We have enough time, enough trouble putting together viable, trustworthy evidence of alien visitation, civilians. The military doesn't want to tell you a diddly toot. But uh, now civilians can make up and rig stuff and just uh, just murky up the water something terrible with uh, fakes and frauds. Right. Yeah, that's, that's the only bad thing about AI. I know it could be helpful. And, you know, like, like your Cape Girardeau, if somebody would make a, an AI presentation, you know, make it more realistic on how it actually happened and kind of document the series of what went on, but not to say that this was the actual incident. Yeah. Uh, or you could say, we found this footage of my grandpa's attic in Cape Girardeau, make it look black and white and shaky like yeah. someone's scared and they're taking footage and, and, and make a fraudulent record and pass it off as, uh, you know, and maybe even sell it for a million dollars, fool somebody. Uh, they kind of did that with that alien autopsy video some 20 years right. ago, I think. And that turned out to be a fake, but they made a lot of money off of that. Got a lot of big TV ratings. And that just gummed up the works, made the whole uh, alien visitation subject more of a laughing stock and to be taken less seriously. It did damage to the Uf pardon me, UFO community. So have you, have you had, going back to our previous conversation last time about Cape Girardeau, have you uh, got any more uh, updates on the, the missing photo that the photographer took? I sure don't. I keep talking about it on interviews and I keep thinking maybe somebody somewhere will send that to the newspaper, to my publishers, to me directly. Like I found a copy of this, but it never shows up. Yeah. Uh, the photographer at the scene uh, what Gerald is telling you, uh, in 1941, took a, a little box camera out and took a snapshot of two men holding up an alien under the arms. It's dead with big black bug eyes, a little gray thing, about three and a half to four feet tall. And two weeks after the event, the photographer showed up at the doorstep of a Cape Girardeau minister and said, I have a copy of this. I want you to have a copy. He recognized the minister as someone who was at the crash scene, maybe even spoke to him. And the minister didn't really want it, but he put it in a box somewhere and let his son have it. And uh, it lasted in the family about 12 years or so. And then a man uh, in Kansas, when they were living in Kansas, asked to see the photo or and he looked it over and said, well, I've got a friend who knows about uh, zoology and uh, I know about photography. I'll look this over with my friend and get it back to you. And that photograph disappeared, never would to return. So, but the key words are the photographer said, I have a copy. I want you to have a copy. Well, how many other copies did you make? It would have been a very important historic photo. But so far, as you say, no copies have turned up. Uh, yeah. You might uh, Google on the internet, by the way, and find uh, a recreation of two men holding up this dead, lifeless alien. That was for a 2003 uh, sci-fi special called The Secret we Evidence that We Are Not Alone. That's just uh, a recreation of the photo. It's not the actual one. People get fooled by that quite often. I, I don't, you know, there's, so there's obviously two copies that we know of or, or it's been substantiated. So yeah. I wonder if that one that got taken by that guy, if he was like a, a he secret, was a, yeah, he was a professional, guy. yeah, he was a professional photographer, knew all about um, negatives and making copies, and he worked for the newspaper. So uh, my dad went to an estate sale where he had lots of photographs laid out on a table, and my dad said, "If only I had known at the time, I would have started sorting through this." But I doubt if he would have put that kind of thing out at a a public yard sale in Cape Girardeau and say, you know, help yourself to this alien photograph I took. However, I keep thinking in his attic, a basement crawl space, uh, buried in his backyard. Could you take a metal detector and look for like a strong box that could have some of these? Uh, or he could have buried them anywhere in town. Uh, and yet uh, those photos have not turned up. Yeah. 
it, I, I'm assuming that the photographer has passed away that took the right. He died in yeah. the early 1980s or no, I think 91 or so. So um, that man's passed away. Everyone from the Cape Girardeau story of 1941 who was there and associated with this passed away. In many cases, their children are passed away. It's becoming kind of like a dead end. I've done the best I could and I've included some updates in a new book that my agent is shopping to a publisher. And hopefully I'll get that out uh, as a new Mo 41, Missouri 1941 book uh, later this year. Oh, nice. Yeah, it'd be nice to have some uh, an update on that book. And, you know, hopefully maybe somebody will find that for that photo, you know, whether it was in an estate sale or maybe it's in an auction, maybe it's in a box, like you said, up in the attic somewhere. Or in a store. Does the family still own the house? Uh, his family does not own the house. They lived on Park Street in Cape Girardeau. I went there and uh, there's all these cars parked out front and I wrote to the family, got no response. And so uh, I feel like they don't know anything about the story. They don't, they're not interested. That's, uh, mm -hmm. I got a variety of uh, reaction to the Cape Girardeau story. Some people were quite fascinated. Oh, that's very intriguing or exciting. Some people say, oh, yes, I've heard of this. Or my grandfather spoke of it long ago. And other people like, that's a bunch of junk, man. Get out of here with that. I even got some hostile reaction from some people I tried to interview. Uh, they think oh. it's all a fraud or that I'm some sort of kook. <laughs> and <laughs> so they didn't want to hear about it. And others were, oh, tell me all about this. You know, there's a variety of human reaction. And this is something the government, I'm sure, takes into account when they ponder the idea of going public with anything, that uh, some people's minds are closed and that uh, there's no telling them, uh, you know, certain things that they don't believe it. But uh, eventually, if we come up with film footage, let's say the government releases footage of an alien autopsy or some uh, live creatures that they interviewed, would anyone believe it now due to AI? You know, it just right. gums up the works and we would say, oh, that's a fake. Look at that. That's a fraud. They just used uh, CGI and AI and the government would say, no, this is the real thing. And so who knows what people's reaction would be uh, nowadays. You know, the only thing that bothers me, or doesn't bother me, but the only thing when I think about this is why haven't we seen a real life instant you know live crash you know with all the cameras and all the webcams and everything going on why haven't we actually seen a so, live somebody yeah. going out there and filming a like, live uh, incident? like a disc coming down over a live football game like monday night football outdoors and that everyone takes footage of it and there could be no question or maybe for the heck of it it lands at midfield and they step out and wave to everyone that there's They're no the question that'd be cool yeah, that would be exciting. What I learned is Eisenhower asked the alien visitors in February of 54, please don't set down in our cities. Don't start a panic. Uh, you'll disrupt society terribly. I don't want you even here, but if you have to, try to remain at arm's length, be aloof, and don't set off uh, uh, alarm bells all over the country and cause the stock market to crash, people be out of work and panicking like War of the Worlds. So they apparently agreed to this, and that's why they won't land at a football game and become the halftime show itself. <laughs> but, you, but you, you know, like I was saying, you'd think there would be like like the Roswell crash, the Cape Girardeau, all these incidents. You'd think somewhere somebody would get lucky enough to have it on film that one actually went down and crashed. Yeah. And then somebody, um, somebody like us would probably go out there with a, a phone or something and actually start recording the site. One of Jackie Gleason's friends was um, uh, Gordon, uh, I forget his name. He was an Air Force test pilot turned, Gordon Cooper, uh, turned astronaut. And Cooper said that he and a camera crew were out in the desert uh, at Edwards Air Force Base taking footage of uh, like jet planes going overhead. And an extraterrestrial type craft, a circular disc came down on skinny little tripod legs and landed uh, not too far away. So they turned their cameras on it, got the film footage, and they brought it uh, to Gordon Cooper where he was. He wasn't on the scene at the time, 
uh, the disc just flew off real quick. And so the camera crew showed it to Gordon and he was amazed and said, well, we got to send this to the Pentagon. And they did. And they never heard back. They just uh -huh. gobbled it up <laughs> and you're never going to see it again. But uh, that's an example of uh, we have the footage. Supposedly, there were two cameramen working uh, in this um, Air Force hangar uh, where Eisenhower was standing at the lip of the runway talking to extraterrestrials who stepped out of their craft peacefully. And the, the cameramen were recording all of this uh, newsreel type footage and film footage. And the aliens in 54 decided to put on a little aerial display of all that they could do in their ships for Eisenhower and his bodyguards. Well, when they did that, supposedly, from what I hear, uh, one of the crafts flew too fast and too close to the airplane hangar and shorted out one of the cameras. Like black and white footage ends abruptly because the technology clashed with the alien uh, spacecraft technology. Oh. But that there's also color footage. Uh, a man named Christopher Barbato uh, it covers the Vatican, and he said a source at the Vatican told me that story, that the Vatican has this footage. And they know full well that Eisenhower met with the uh, friendly aliens, and they, they uh, had took uh, some uh, color footage and black and white footage that ended abruptly because the camera shorted out. So that's tantalizing. That could be something that could be leaked accidentally on purpose or hacked into, uh, go around the Pentagon and the CIA and go after what the Vatican has or the United Nations or something like that. I have no idea how to do such things and I don't want to start anything or get into trouble myself. But uh, if someone is in the government and wants to really make a splash before they retire or pass away, they could accidentally uh, release to the public some footage like uh, this uh, Skinny Bob uh, images that came about in, I think, 2011. Yeah, be, wouldn't it be amazing, though, to see what's in the Vatican catacombs, and let yeah. alone Apparently what the they got a lot of is hiding from us? Yeah. Uh, supposedly they have a lot of stuff uh, hidden away, and uh, you got to wonder if it's uh, valid and like revealing things about Christ uh, and maybe his return or something. And, and the uh, what was that, uh, Fatima or Fatima right. in, in yeah. Portugal or Spain, and, and what really went on there? That's still a bit of a mystery that uh, uh, Mother Mary, the Virgin Mary, showed up with revelations of the future. And the popes have been sitting on this and a little of it got leaked over the years. And so uh, that's the sort of thing that's being held back. Uh, it's tantalizing. I think we're ready to hear such things. Uh, I don't think of uh, the public as children anymore, uh, that the government does, that we're still too uh, infantile to absorb and accept this. But there are a few people that, yeah, I mentioned uh, closed-minded and don't want to hear about it, but I think they're quite the minority, and most people are curious and would accept it without freaking out. I do, too. It's just, it's just the validity part, you know, like we were talking about AI and, okay, something from the way back that the Vatican might have, you know, whether it's Christ time or whatever. It's like, well, how do we really know that's the, the original document? You know, so I, I I just like to see going back to the aliens, like something live, a live event that happened and yeah, caught on film, real time coverage. Uh, I'm trying to think um, of uh, something that happened beyond Cape Girardeau or Roswell, like a Kingman, Arizona crash or Aztec, New Mexico, where a crash it was barely even damaged, was recovered and bodies were removed. I think that case is quite real, and I'll bet there's footage of that. Uh, at least one being that uh, was friendly was taken from that Aztec, uh, March 1949, uh, if I'm not, 48 or 49, and, and maybe we could reveal that to, as a starter, uh, that it doesn't have to be anything recent. It could be like 60, 70 years ago to start bracing people up and, and releasing this information slowly. I'm hopeful, but, you know, I'm from Missouri, uh, the show me state. You got to show me and, and then I'll believe that uh, this is happening instead of uh, some anonymous source leaking what they 
say is footage and it turns out it's AI fakery. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even some footage from say the Pentagon was supposed to have an aliens in there working in the basements or whatever has been there yeah. for a long time. I mean, just show me something that's legit, you know, and then, then we'll start from this point on. Anytime something happens, you know, tell us, show us, don't hide it from us. Well, I've got probably enough information on Ronald Reagan to do a third presidential book. Oh. I don't have that much new, though. Stuff that I've dug into has largely been disseminated on websites, podcasts, and uh, TV shows. But supposedly, there was this rumor that uh, Steven Spielberg took E.T., the extraterrestrial, the film, to the White House and showed it to Reagan. And when it was over, Reagan turned to him and said, you don't know how right you are. And that uh, in intimated quite strongly that this really happened. Uh, an extraterrestrial creature was uh, captured and uh, was um, uh, interrogated and such, and that the American government knows we're being uh, visited quite strongly. So that rumor went around, and a few years ago, Spielberg addressed it himself, finally at last, and put the rumor to rest and said, it's true. Reagan did say this to me. He was not laughing when he said it. And it gives you the impression, uh, I don't think Spielberg's a liar at all. He had no reason to lie. That, uh, again, Reagan knew uh, other presidents in the past, like Nixon and Johnson, maybe Kennedy, and certainly Eisenhower, Truman, possibly FDR at the time of the Cape Girardeau crash, which I think was our first, that they all know were being visited. And they keep their mouths shut to avoid a War of the Worlds style panic from taking place and an economic crash that would damage people's lives terribly. I think less and less of that uh, approach now that we're more mature and braced up for this, but uh, who knows what's going to happen. Maybe in three years we'll find out everything. <laughs> yeah, never know. Well, the I, I think probably a pretty good time to stop unless you have more that you want to talk about, about Nixon or Gleason or any other presidents. Uh, no, uh, Jackie uh, did some more movies, kept his mouth shut on aliens, and died uh, without apparently releasing a deathbed confession. Nixon also said nothing about the uh, encounter, and uh, people around them that were uh, friends or relatives are all passed away. However, Beverly Gleason is still alive. I could not find her. I enlisted a couple of UFO people to research it and find her. They can't find her either. She must be close to 90 by now, and maybe uh, I don't know what shape is she in, but she obviously doesn't want to talk about it. In the year 2000, though, she did give a third interview on the subject, stuck with the story all the way, uh, didn't deny anything, didn't say, oh, I was just joking about that. She didn't change her tale at all. So that may be all that she has to tell about it, everything she knows. So the story is there, and it's in book form, and audio book form, and you can find it on Amazon and Tantor.com, and leave a nice review online if you want to, to be helpful, and I appreciate it, and uh, I thank you for having me on. It was fun to talk about, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I like these stories, and yeah. especially talking to you, you know, coming from Cape Girardeau, and you're right yeah. there in that area to, to dig up more information than, say, I would, you know, up in Illinois. Uh, that's another fascinating story. Maybe we can do another one if I get another new updated book to come out, and I'll be back on Piercing the Veil, whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Force my way on. So everybody look forward to uh, Paul's book, his updated book on Cape Girardeau. And uh, I'm, I, you know what I would like to see? I'd like to see a movie come out of uh, about the car Cape Girardeau. I've written maybe a screenplay. I'll use your, maybe I'll use your book. Yeah, I've written a screenplay. I'd like to see my agent land it in the hands of a producer. The problem is today's movie world wants modern stuff, uh, color footage, you know, not old black and white tales and photos. And 1941, that's not even World War II. And so it's tough to get a movie made that would require lots of computer special effects and be set in the 40s. And people today, young people, movie-going audiences wouldn't be too keen on that. So yeah, I'm sorry that it doesn't look good that it'll get made. I, I still watch black and white movies. Actually, I watch them all the time, but yeah. that's just me. 
for some people, that's it, that they won't cross that line. All oh, that's old stuff. I don't want to see black and white. But for others, it, it makes it even more fascinating, like film noir. And, uh, you know, they live on in TV channels. And hopefully yeah. we'll get the, the Cape Toronto story and the Nixon Gleason. Got a screenplay on that. Uh, it's currently being reviewed by a producer person. But uh, again, I, I'm told, well, Nixon and Gleason are long since dead. There's no young person in here to base the story around. Movie going audiences want to see young faces. And, uh, you know, teenagers in love are, you know, chasing around through the universe. So don't hold your breath on that either. <laughs> oh, well, maybe it should be a, a young person or somebody of this time finds information yeah. new about that yeah. and then drag you into the old story. Yeah, that could be one approach. We'll see what happens. There's all kinds of uh, platforms like Netflix and Hulu and Apple and Peacock, and they need yeah. content. They need original stories. So I got that working for me. We just have to get it into the right hands and see what happens. All right. Well, I'm hopeful that that happens. Me too, because I could use the money. <laughs> <laughs> Show me the money. That's right. Yep. Don't want to be greedy, but I'm going to have to enter that next uh, Powerball and uh, uh, scratch off a few lottery tickets here. Yeah, um, then you can produce your own money. You that's can right. Who, who needs the Hollywood? I'll do it myself. That's right. All right. Well, we'll just say goodbye to everybody and uh, everybody in chat. Thank you so much for showing up. And I, I've been reading your comments and uh, I hope I didn't miss any questions because I was looking for them. But I didn't really see any questions for Paul and we'll, we'll be sure to have him back if he has an update and when his new book comes out and uh, we'll just see you later. Love you guys. Right. Keep, keep looking up. Bye.